Great. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, connect with all of you. Um, uh, this uh, presentation is provided by P2P Synchro and is supported by an independent educational grant from Novo Nordisk. Uh, my name is David Sass. I'm a pediatric nephrologist uh, with uh, a, an interest in kidney stones and in particular rare kidney stone diseases like primary hyperoxaluria. Dr. Wood, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, well, I'm, Wood. I'm an endourologist at the University of Alabama. What that means is I specialize in surgical treatment of kidney stones, but I have a special interest in rare genetic diseases and stones, and I do quite a bit of research on hyperoxaluria, and so that is my true passion. All right. Great. So we have, uh, as you're aware, there's an opportunity to submit uh, questions through the, through the Q&A, which is separate from the chat, just so you're not confused. There's the normal Zoom chat that we are not using, but then there's the Q&A where you can submit your questions. But we also have some uh, some other questions that we wanted to get to initially. Management, um, you know, what, what should be done about water intake and diet? So um, in terms of modifying the diet, um, and I, I don't know, Dr. Wood, you can tell me if you do it differently, but I don't recommend strict low oxalate diet for patients with primary hyperoxaluria. So the, we, what I say is try to avoid excessive intake of oxalate, right? So there, you know, the co contribution of dietary oxalate to the disease when you have primary hyperoxaluria is really pretty minimal. When you have primary hyperoxaluria, you are forming all of that oxalate from your body, regardless of your diet. So yeah, you don't want to go crazy, and eat too much oxalate, but the truth is most oxalate containing foods are pretty healthy foods, right? So it's, uh, we try not to restrict them if we don't have to. And um, so I think the conventional wisdom is that dietary oxalate does not contribute very much um, to the problem when you have primary hyperoxaluria. Do you, is that, do you counsel? The yeah, same thing? So, yeah. So, you know, uh, Ross Holmes and John Knight and Dina Simos did a lot of these studies where they looked at what do we actually absorb from the dietary oxalate. And roughly it's about three milligrams for a hundred milligrams that we take in. And if you talk about a very low oxalate diet, you know, they're talking about 50 to hundred milligrams, which is really quite hard to do on a daily basis. And it's not very, palatable. I mean, it's not foods that we're going to want to take in and stick to, and it's really hard to do. And if you think about a normal diet of, if we avoid the high oxalate foods and we take in a normal moderate oxalate diet, which is much easier to do, you're only talking about 200 milligrams in the food, 300 milligrams, which only is contributing a very small amount to the urine oxalate. So as Dr. Sass was pointing out, in reality, we know that this is what we call an endogenous, right? It's your body's making the oxalate. And so we're really focused on that part of it because the diet is not the major contributor to what's happening in the urine. And then, you know, we want to talk about all the things that actually we know can help. And we want our patients to focus on those things. And that's fluid intake. And then we can sometimes come in with what we call alkalizing agents or potassium citrate. And so there's other things. And then certain types of primary hyperoxyuria can respond to vitamin B6 or pyridoxine. So I know many people on this call, if they have primary hyperoxyuria type one, they've been treated with pyridoxine as an initial, initial therapy to see if that would work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we do. So definitely the mainstay of therapy for all three types uh, for really any stone disease, full stop is lots of water. Right. And so the more severe your stone disease, the more water you have to drink. So patients with primary hyperoxaluria, I would, uh, are among the, the, the leaders in terms of having to drink a lot of, of fluid. So, you know, it, for me as a pediatric nephrologist, it depends on the age of the child, how much water I recommend. Um, the, the, the lowest for my, um, uh, for infants, I recommend about 750 milliliters a day, um, which, which it's actually not so hard to get fluid into infants because they get a hundred percent of their nutrition at first from either breast milk or formula. So that's actually a little bit easier to do. It gets a little bit harder when they're toddlers and 
don't want to do what they're supposed to do. Um, so for the Mars, so for some patients, the, the, the need for fluid is so severe that in very young children, we often recommend putting in a uh, what we call a gastrostomy tube or G-tube that goes in through the skin directly into the stomach. And this way you can give as much water as you need to without having to fight with a, um, a stubborn toddler. So, so that's how important water is, uh, that sometimes we'll actually have surgery performed to make sure they get enough. So, um, and then when they're adolescents and adults, you know, three, four five liters of water is not an atypical um, uh, recommendation. And then, you know, I know one of the questions that was going along with that is why do we get so much blood in urine testing? And really we're getting the blood to monitor the kidneys, the kidney function. We may be looking in certain situations at what's called plasma oxalate or the oxalate levels in the blood. And then we're also monitoring if we're giving certain therapies like potassium citrate, we're looking at those electrolytes to make sure everything's okay in the blood. And then the urine's really to look at what's happening with the oxalate. And so how is the oxalate responding to the therapies we're doing? Have we reduced what we call like the saturation or the supersaturation of the urine? So we're reducing the risk of stones forming and crystals forming. So that's why we get them frequently and often because we're trying to stay up on that. And so, all right, so in terms of like, you know, basic traditional treatment for all forms of pH, we mentioned um, lots and lots of water. We mentioned uh, the subset of patients with pH one who respond to pyridoxine or vitamin B6. Um, and uh, we talked about avoiding massive amounts of oxalate in the diet. One other thing that I counsel all my patients on is trying to um, avoid excess salt or sodium in the diet. And that's, you know, we know the more salt, salt is generally uh, promotes stone formation uh, through various mechanisms. And, and, you know, almost all of us eat too much salt uh, in our diet anyway. So that's sort of just a healthy thing to do that's good for reducing stone risk. Do you talk about uh, salt to your patients? I do all the time. Yes. No. And it's just one of those, again, it's one of those, I think a low hanging fruit that people can go after and really control themselves at home. So, yeah. And it's, and it's so interesting. I do an exercise with my patients, uh, almost every, every patient, uh, when we talk about sodium, you know, they say, Oh, I don't eat that much salt. And I say, okay, let's talk. Great. Wonderful. Let's talk about what you had for lunch today. Oh, well, I went to, you know, Quiznos and I got the, I got a meatball sandwich. Okay. Well, guess what? Great. The, the one nice thing about the era we live in is that everything is online. So if you, um, uh, as long, unless it's like a small mom and pop operation, if it's a, if it's a chain restaurant, they're required by law to put all their nutritional information online. So you can look up uh, the amount of sodium or anything else um, on just about anything. So we, we go through this exercise where we look it up and you went, okay, you went to Quiznos and you got this meatball. Oh, look at that. 3,600 milligrams of sodium in that sandwich. It's somewhere in that ballpark. I'm not remembering exactly, but I think it's 3,600. And I've just told this, you know, young adolescent that he should limit his uh, sodium intake to 1,800 milligrams a day. And this one sandwich has double that. So this is an exercise that I do. And I, and I suggest all of you start to look at that. Um, if you're not doing it all already, just look at labels because it's not always the sodium isn't always highest where you think it would be, right? If I ask this group, uh, what, tell me, give me a, a high salt foods, 90% of the answers I would get would be French fries or potato chips. And I would never sit here and tell you that French fries or potato chips are healthy foods. But if you look at the, the sodium content of a typical bag of chips or McDonald's French fries, you're a, a serving of graham crackers, honey made graham crackers probably has more which is insane, right? Nobody would say that graham crackers are saltier than French fries, but it turns out that's why we need to look at the labels because it's it um, uh, can be very surprising. So it's often a, an educational experience for people to start looking at these things. So, okay, um, we got uh, one, one more uh, treatment thing before we get into siRNA and that's potassium citrates. So someone asked, does potassium citrate really work? We think so. So potassium citrate, 
is a crystal inhibitor. So before you get stones, full-blown stones, it starts with crystals in the urine. And so one of the ways you can keep those crystals from getting to, from forming and getting together is by getting citrate into the urine. And so we take potassium citrate by mouth and that leads to higher citrate in the urine. And what the citrate does is it binds up with the calcium, making the calcium unavailable to bind up with oxalate and cause trouble. So we do believe that that's a, a helpful component for patients who form calcium oxalate stones. You said it perfectly, Dr. Sass. I think it's, I think we can go, uh, I, I know people have a lot of questions in the, in the Q and A. So I think Dr. Sass and I will go over the RNAi therapies because I think it answers some of the questions that are in the Q and A. So there are two types of, there's two RNAi therapies out there. There's nadasarin and lumasarin. They do target different things. The way they're designed is when they're given to you in subcutaneously, they have a part of its design goes to just the liver, which is where the endogenous oxalates being created and where the enzymes that it's targeting are going to. Lumasarin targets an enzyme called glycolate oxidase, and then nadasaran targets an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Both of those are in the oxalate pathway, and they both pretty much result into this, in the same thing, which is a decrease in the amount of oxalate that our body produces. And so they are dosed a little bit differently, as people that might be on them know. So nadasaran is dosed on a monthly basis, and then after a loading dose with lumasaran, it's dosed on a quarterly basis. And so that's how they work. They are designed to basically block an enzyme in the pathway, which then results in decreased oxalate. Yeah, yeah. So they, they decrease the production of oxalate, which then reduces the amount of oxalate in the urine and theoretically should reduce the risk for kidney stone formation and also re reduce the risk of diminishing kidney function over time. Now, those those last two things have not been proven yet, but really because we just haven't had enough time yet um, on these drugs. Those things take time to prove from a research basis. So um, we have what we have shown in the clinical studies is that both drugs definitely reduce urinary oxalate significantly. Um, so that's, it, it, and then we think the rest will follow, but we need the long-term studies to answer that question. So we think Nidoseran and lamasaran will lead to less stone production. We think it will lead to lower risk for progression of, of uh, kidney disease to kidney failure. Um, and uh, time will tell. So it is certainly, um, uh, I would say, so one of the questions was, you know, is it, does it truly count as a cure? Well, I wouldn't say it's a cure, but it's a treatment. Um, uh, it it uh, should certainly improve your odds of uh, staying healthy. So I think, you know, for sure, you can still form stones, right? Because it it both of these drugs can reduce your urinary oxalate by roughly sixty five percent. Different patients react differently. Again, that's why you need to keep monitoring, keep going to your pediatric nephrologist or adult nephrologist or urologist or pediatric urologist, and keep following up with them and monitoring that oxalate. So, because if you have, you know, uh, if you're um, uh, your, let's just say your urine oxalate, let's say you have really severe disease and your urine oxalate is 200 milligrams per day and normal is 50. Like even if that drug is really super effective and brings you down to 80, that's super effective. That drug is working really, really well, but you're still above, you know, well above the normal range. So you might still be at risk for stones, but you know, in, in like a super severe case, maybe instead of forming, you know, 12 stones a year, you form three stones not ideal, not perfect, but certainly better. Yeah, and as Do Dr. Sass pointed out, we're waiting on the long-term data, but we do truly believe it will decrease stone risk and decrease the risk of kidney failure. And that's kind of changed. I know one of the questions in the Q&A is about, you know, the transplantation and stuff. So one of the things, it's changing the paradigm for us. So for a lot of our patients, once they their kidneys had failed because of the oxalosis or the oxalate deposition, we would, we would give them a liver kidney transplant. That's changing now because of the drug therapy. We are, some of us are often considering now keeping people on nadasaran or lamasaran, and if it's working well, just giving a kidney transplant in those that need a kidney. 
and avoiding the liver kidney transplant. But these are things that we're studying right now, and we don't know the long term yet. We don't have the data yet. We have anecdotal data because all of us are treating patients, and we've seen the oxalate decrease. We've seen their quality of life improve. We've seen the decrease in stone disease, and we believe in the preservation of the renal function. But yet we still don't know. So, But the paradigm is changing amongst us and how we're thinking about the disease. So, and and Dr. Wood, for, for those who still are forming stones or the, with P, those with pH 2 and pH 3 who don't have a treatment uh, yet, uh, tell us a little bit. Can you give us an overview of the, the procedures that might be needed to remove stones surgically? Yeah, so I'll talk about three different procedures just quickly, just so that everybody kind of has an understanding, and then we can hopefully get into some of the Q&A. So there's three types of ways that the urologists remove stones. The most common way is what we call ureteroscopy, where we go in with cameras. The reason why we choose that is the least invasive way and has the highest success rate. So those two combines, right? So we go in with cameras. We're just, we're not cutting anything. We're just going in and we're using miniature lasers and baskets to remove the stone. Just because it's in a very effective treatment doesn't mean it's not painful. Anybody that's undergone a stone procedure, the stents, we have to leave stents in oftentimes afterwards, and that's protecting the kidney. And those stents can be extremely painful. If people have really large stones, or if they have anatomy that makes it difficult for us to get to the stones, sometimes we have to go through the back. We make a small incision and then go into the kidney. And then we have instruments that go through into the kidney. And then for lack of a better way of saying, we have like li little mini jackhammers that break up the stones and suck them out. And that's called percutaneous nephrostolithotomy. That's a much more invasive surgery and we only utilize it for larger stones. And then there are people that are doing shockwave lithotripsy where they deliver energy through the kidney in the back so that we don't actually have to enter the body to break up the stones. Most of us that treat our primary hyperoxyuria patients try to avoid the procedure, not always, but it is sending energy waves through the kidney tissue, and there is some hypothetical long-term consequences that can happen if you have that a lot. So ureteroscopy is sort of the mainstay, and the technology is quite advanced these days with our cameras, our lasers, and our op the way we can visualize things, and they've gotten smaller and smaller. So there's really no anatomy, and even in a young child, that prevents us from being able to access the kidney now. Great. Yeah. So yeah, the urologists are, are uh, the, the heroes who really uh, do the most important work in terms of making you feel better or making your child uh, uh, feel better. So my, and, and we love our urology colleagues, but our jobs as nephrologists are to keep you away from people like Kyle Wood. <laughs> um, but, but boy, when you need them there, they are the superheroes. So, all right, great. So um, now we'll, we'll jump into some of these. Um, oh, one last thing about siRNA. There was one comment about will insurance companies pay for the drugs? Thank it's it, that's always a that's a variable question for everything for every day. I literally had a, an insurance company refuse sodium bicarbonate for a patient, and I looked it up. It costs a dollar seventy three a month for sodium bicarbonate, and they made me fill out a nine page form. So you never know is the answer, but we, it does seem that insurance companies are in the United States are paying for these medications. Um, and sometimes it's one and not the other. Um, so it's hard to predict, but you know, we, we cross our fingers and hope for the best and do everything that we can to get these siRNA treatments for our patients because they work. So 